BBC Two Time Watch presents a portrait of the man who lived life in the fast lane. Ferrari. The name evokes a heady mix of speed, danger and glamour. One man left a legacy of the greatest racing cars and the greatest drivers in the history of motorsport. It is a line that stretches down to current world champion Michael Schumacher. A whole country like here in Italy is behind Ferrari. It's not like a soccer club where you have part of the country behind. Here, a whole, co whole country is behind. If you go around the world, everywhere, I mean, Ferrari uh, is, uh, is in the heart of, of, of the people. Today, Team Ferrari rule the world. It's the ultimate tribute to its founder, Enzo Ferrari. The attitude we had was probably similar to uh, fighter pilots during the Second World War, and they knew that any one day could be their last. Enzo Ferrari had a dream. To achieve it, he would shape, he would test, he would manipulate everyone around him. Ferrari's famously secretive life is a story of fast cars, of danger, and above all, of death. Tonight, Time Watch lifts the veil on the secrets of Enzo Ferrari. Enzo Ferrari didn't produce the cars that bore his name until he was nearly 50 years old. But the seeds of the Ferrari story lay in the first half of his life. One driver and one extraordinary pre-war race were to shape Ferrari's destiny. Little in his childhood suggested a man whose name would become so associated with excitement and glamour. He was born in 1898 and spent his early years here in the city of Modena. It was a city he never left. In the rigid society of 19th century Italy, his was a family from the wrong side of the tracks. He never hid the fact he grew up as a kid from the streets, from the outskirts of Modena. I think Ferrari was completely formed by the environment in, w in which he grew. I don't think there was ever in his mind any desire to break away from the values, from the traditions in which he grew up. His father had a small engineering workshop providing metalwork for the railways. Enzo, his parents and his elder brother Dino grew up above it. He was jealous of his brother. A jealousy because the brother was good at school. When he went shooting, the brother hit the target and he didn't. Enzo's was a traditional and by all accounts unremarkable youth. It might well have stayed that way if it were not for the cataclysm of the First World War. Both Ferrari brothers joined up for combat. Enzo was sent to serve with an artillery unit. In 1916, both his father and brother died. Enzo too contracted a near fatal illness on the front line. He was sent to a hospital for the incurably sick. He was ill and he heard the hammering. Boom, 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 the nails in the coffins of those who were dying in the hospital. Death had entered the Ferrari story, and it was never to leave. Only his mother was still living. His mom said, you know that I had two kids. One died in the war. And of my two kids, the best one, 
the sharpest one died. Non so come facesse giudicare questo. He had a very ambitious mother. I think, you know, his mother pushed him um, to, to do something. I'm sure that's a significant factor in his life. Essentially, he had to manufacture his own destiny. Age 20, the end of the war found Ferrari demobbed with no job. But the loss of his father and older brother freed him to pursue his childhood ambition. As a youth, he was smitten with motor racing. I asked myself, why can't I myself become a great racing driver one day? And all my acts after that were merely the consequence of an adolescent dream. Ferrari sold the family home and used the money to buy a sports car. This was his one-way ticket into the fledgling post-war motoring scene. Tutto sacrificando per avere una macchina da corsa. He sacrificed everything to have a sports car, which earned him in his own town the nickname of Madman. La qualifica di Matt. And for many years he was called the Nutter Ferrari. Il matto Ferrari. Motoring in those days was a new activity. You know, people were very, very keen on it, and um, uh, and it was a bit like aviation. You know, it was a sort of a secret society that you, you could join if you hung around enough. And he spent a lot of time in bars, I think, where pioneer automobilists gathered and became known. Enzo Ferrari quickly fulfilled his childhood dream and became a racing driver in a sport that immediately caught the public imagination. These drivers were the chariot racers of their day. What we have here is a typical pre-First World War I, just post-First World War I, thoroughbred racing car. What's really amazing is that before World War I, motor racing had become so popular Tens of thousands of people would turn out for those unbelievable road races on public roads. And this is typical of the type of car that Enzo Ferrari would have got his hands on. I mean, it's got a really big engine under here pumping out horsepower. This car can do 120 miles an hour and regularly do 70, 80 miles an hour on those roads. And look what you've got here. Next to nothing, just a skinny little aluminium body, a fuel tank full of high octane petrol, which of course was like a bomb if anything ever went wrong. And of course, a driver and a racing mechanic to help him out who were complete and utterly unprotected. A pair of old World War I aviators goggles here with a bit of glass in the front. If a stone hit that, you could lose an eyeball. And the worst part about it was, he hasn't got any front wheel brakes at all. I mean, there's nothing there. Just look at that. I mean, you're bundling along, you want to stop for a corner, something goes wrong, you've had it. One figure stood out in the 1920s racing scene, Tazio Nuvolari. He was a man who had come to change Ferrari's life. There's a strong case for saying that um, Nuvolari was the best driver who ever lived. Italians turned out in their thousands to watch him race. People thought he had a death wish or was in league with the devil. You could see in the way that Nuvolari's car slid around the corner, you know, that he was on the edge all the time and that it was a really exciting place to be. Ferrari, who was driving for Alfa Romeo, raced against him. When he saw Nuvolari, you know, he saw the perfect racing driver for him. And I think that ideal never left him. Nuvolari era un, uh, un impetuoso, era un... Nuvolari was impetuous, instinctive a brave driver, brave enough to take life-threatening risks, a driver who Ferrari never hesitated in using as his yardstick for judging other drivers. Ferrari's own career as a racing driver was inconsistent. He had a period where he won races, but he was never in the top bracket. 
But in 1924, he'd been doing well enough that he did get the chance to drive Alfa Romeo's best car, uh, their real sort of Formula One machine, at the French Grand Prix in Lyon. And he got there, and he practised, and he came home. There's never been a really satisfactory explanation. I think most people feel that he had some kind of psychological meltdown. And that marked the end of his own career as a racing driver. Yet, this man who actually didn't, in fact, have the bottle to do it himself, he made himself absolutely remorseless uh, in his attitude to his own drivers. He expected the maximum from them, and often the maximum wasn't in itself enough. Ferrari's failure as a racing driver was to prove the start of an extraordinary success story. He was already managing Alfa Romeo's racing team. He soon persuaded them to race their cars under his name. The Scuderia, or Team Ferrari, was born. The prancing horse insignia of his dead brother's wartime unit became the logo of this remarkable team leader. Enzo Ferrari was cunning, manipulative, ruthless, literally driven. Uh, he was that sort of psychological type He'd come from a background uh, in a very feudal-type Italy. A few years previously, they'd probably put an army together and used swords and scabbards and everything else. But Ferrari, in turn, you know, wanted to make... You know, obviously, was, uh, to him, a major factor was uh, stamping the name Ferrari on Italian society. I think Ferrari was very, very gifted as an organiser and an operator. I think he was really good at, um, at pulling people together, making them work together, encouraging them. He said that uh, he was an agitator of men and ideas. He was very good at human relationships. You know, he's got a, a reputation of being a difficult, cantankerous, argumentative, cruel, cynical, you know, Machiavellian man, but he must have propaganda possibilities. By the mid-1930s, probably in an effort to underline German racial superiority, the Nazi government were pumping thousands of marks into the motor racing scene. Basically, they were determined to produce a German car that won all the Grand Prix. They wanted to show that German technology was superior to the rest of the world, and they were prepared to effectively subsidise the German Grand Prix teams. Two teams rose to the top of the heap, Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union, which had cars designed by Dr. Ferdinand Porsche. The Germans developed a Grand Prix supercar, the Auto Union. For the first time, they put the engine behind the driver. And there were other new elements of design, revolutionary braking and suspension, which meant the cars handled much better. Ferrari and Nuvolari, racing the Alpha P3, were completely outclassed. The Germans were winning everything. But one extraordinary race, one extraordinary act of defiance, was about to engrave itself on Ferrari's mind. The showdown of the 1935 season was the German Grand Prix, here at the purpose-built Nürburgring. Well, the Nürburgring is generally described as one of the most demanding circuits in the world. It's 14.2 miles long, 174 corners apparently. It's an extraordinarily snaking, difficult course. And one, I suppose, that in the end allows the top driver the biggest chance to win the race, even if he's got inferior equipment, is, is very much a driver's circuit. There's a crowd here of about 400,000, and every single person in that crowd was expecting a German victory. Nuvolari starts out like a man possessed. He's throwing himself into the corners. He is absolutely determined to win this race. And incredibly, despite the technical inferiority of his car, he's actually in the lead by the 10th lap. And that's when the drama starts, because at the end of the following lap, he comes into the pits for a routine stop to change his tyres and for fuel. Unfortunately, the fuel pump breaks, and they actually have to finish filling up his car with jerry cans and, and literally siphoning it into his car. He loses almost two minutes. 
New Valari comes out after this disastrous pit stop in sixth place, and no one in this huge crowd think he's got any chance of winning this race. And so begins what many believe is the finest drive ever in the history of Grand Prix racing. He's throwing his car into every corner, skidding around the corners, hardly bothering to use the brakes. It's the most extraordinary effort to actually get this inferior car up and past four of the German cars that are ahead of him until only one is remaining, Von Brauchitsch's Mercedes. And with three laps to go, Von Brauchitsch has a lead of 65 seconds, and that, most people consider, is probably still enough. Von Brauchitsch can see as he gets onto the last lap, that New Valari is actually in sight now, this tiny red speck in his wing mirror, and it's probably that that forces him to push just a little bit too hard, and his tyre bursts. The crowd here don't know it, but when they see the New Valari's car, this red speck tearing up the finishing straight, they're horrified. The chequered flag comes out, he's won the most extraordinary victory, and there's stunned silence. They can't believe it. I think this race sears into Enzo Ferrari's mind the template of a perfect driver, a man who can overcome all odds, who can basically produce a, the finest driving race despite the fact that he has an inferior car, and he's always looking for that man. But shortly after his hour of triumph, New Valari quit Ferrari and joined the technically superior Germans. Ferrari not only lost his perfect driver, he also lost his job. Alfa Romeo sacked him. With the onset of the Second World War, Ferrari began running a small munitions factory making parts for aero engines and machine guns. The war was to prove a business opportunity. As American bombs were falling on Ferrari's workshops, he was already planning ahead to a peacetime future, racing his own cars. He bought land while it was cheap near Modena as a site for his factory. And Ferrari cultivated everyone. Fascists, partisans, communists. Nothing would stand in the way of his post-war ambitions. If Ferrari had been in politics, Machiavelli would have been his servant. <laughs> really. <laughs> By 1947, Ferrari had made his first racing cars. By the early 50s, they were sweeping all before him on the racetrack. His hardened professional drivers won him three world championships. But as Ferrari was riding high, tragedy was about to strike. In the 20s, he had married a spirited local girl named Laura Garello. And Lara was a very, very big part of Ferrari's success. Um, her drive, her ambition, her desire for her husband to be a success. Um, and, her, and his willingness to be a, a partner in, with her in a sense that might have been quite unusual in Italy in those days. Together, they had a son called Dino, who was born in 1932. He was very attached, very. He once said that the only true love is that between a father and his son. An extraordinary thing to say. Ferrari's heir was the successor to all his ambitions. But by the 50s, when Dino was in his late teens, it was clear he was suffering from an incurable and progressive form of muscular dystrophy. Ferrari tried to involve his increasingly immobile son in the life of the factory. When he came to the office, when Dino was still there, when he was near to him, he held him because he knew he could fall over. Enzo Ferrari's son and heir died in 1956, aged just 24. When he was alone and talking about him, the tears would come. The hard man cracked. 
Ferrari, tutte le mattine. Ferrari would stop by my house every morning on his way to the cemetery. He didn't miss a single day. If you go to the tomb, look at Dino. He did this to his face. He caressed his face this way even after his death. Death would remain at the heart of the Ferrari story. His father, his brother, now his son. And a long series of young men would also lose their lives, helping Ferrari shape his dreams. Grand Prix was about to enter what many still see as its golden age of glamour and excitement. And Enzo Ferrari's red cars would be at the heart of it. Being a driver in the 50s was a dangerous business. Every year, out of a field of 20 or so top drivers, three or four would be killed. Most of the uh, Grand Prix were run on ordinary roads, the roads that were closed for the uh, occasion, for the Grand Prix. And therefore, if you made one mistake, uh, it could be your last, because uh, the road was lined with... Uh, uh, telegraph poles with trees, with ditches and uh, brick walls. Well, the fuel tanks, of course, one there, one here, and you can have one in the back. Uh, the problem, of course, when you, when you crash is that they're likely to catch fire. You'd have a leak in one of the fuel tanks, and you'd end up with fuel washing around your legs and things like this, or at least your overall soaking up fuel. Well, it was the right spirit anyway, even if it did go in the wrong place. This is a crash hat of my era. It was actually a polo for people paying polo. It's made of canvas glue and glue. Dad said to me, this is the beginning of my career actually, he said to me, if you want to race, you're going to have to wear a crash hat. And I hadn't seen this nice light one. And I said, well, Dad, that's a bit sissy. None of the fast drivers wear them. The attitude we had was, was probably similar to uh, fighter pilots during the, um, the Second World War. The crowd rushed forward as Tony Brooks has a narrow escape when his BRM crashes. And they knew that any one day could be their last, but because it happened so frequently, there was an element of conditioning going on, and uh, it was a way of life which you, um, which you accepted. The good thing about danger is it sharpens up the whole business. I mean, it's rather like gambling. If I gamble with you and we're only gambling for, co for not coins, but for chips, not very important, you start paying in pounds or euros or whatever, then it gets more serious. Well, if you then sort of say, well, look, I'll put it in the biggest bit I've got, and that's my life. Boy, it sure sharpens it up. To subsidize his passion for racing, Ferrari had started building sports cars. These road versions of his high-performance racing cars sold to the post-war rich and famous. And it was from the ranks of his young Playboy customers that Ferrari started drawing his drivers. Ever canny, he saw a saving to be made in amateurs' wage rates. For 42 years and three months, I worked for Ferrari, and I never saw him cry once, apart from one day at the tax office. <laughs> for Ferrari's young playboy drivers, there were strong incentives to get into racing, aside from financial reward. One of the great attractions of Formula One then, and not only Formula One, but motor racing per se, was there were a lot of pretty girls. And there's no doubt that uh, if you're a racing driver and you had you know, your overalls and so on, you could pull in the crumpet. And that's one of the attractions, I reckon, you know, really. Ferrari fostered a particularly intense atmosphere in his factory. He himself rarely took a day off. And if Ferrari worked Christmas Day, he expected his employees to do the same. È stato un padrone esigente. Lui voleva e pretendeva. He was a very demanding boss. He wanted 125% out of you. And if one day you dreamt of giving 110%,
you were already seriously deficient. Ferrari, in public, always gave credit to the skills of the young men who drove his machines. The relationship between the car and the driver is very simple. I always thought of it as a percentage, 50% the skill of the driver and 50% the skill of the car constructor. In private, Ferrari was less generous. The car was certainly seen by him to be the reason for success, not the driver. The driver for him was a mere accessory of the racing car, not even an accessory. One customer turned driver, Eugenio Castellotti, crashed and died while defending a low-priority track record. The team manager called Ferrari back at the office to tell him that um, there'd been this terrible accident. And Ferrari was, sat there and the, took the telephone call, listened to the team manager and said, oh, Castellotti è morto. Castellotti's dead. Dispiace. I'm sorry. E la macchina? And the car? Over the coming two years, the name of Ferrari would become inextricably entwined with the premature death of the young and beautiful. Alfonso de Portajo, an heir to the Spanish throne, was another of Ferrari's wealthy playboy drivers. Ferrari persuaded him to take part in the Mille Miglia, a thousand-mile road race around North Italy. Up to 10 million Italians crowded the route to watch. My Merck was doing up to 175, 178 mile, miles an hour, not for kilometers. I mean, you know it's fast. When you're going along fast with a straight one, it's a twin-engined aircraft, and you're overtaking it. De Portagio was reported to have had a bad feeling about taking part. Before his final checkpoint, he embraced his girlfriend, Hollywood actress Linda Christian, in one last passionate kiss. Hours later, he was dead. Driving at 130 miles an hour, he clipped a curb and flew into a crowd of onlookers, killing himself and 13 others. Among the dead were five children. Ferrari was charged with manslaughter and only acquitted after four years of legal wrangling. It was to get worse. The 1958 season was to prove one of the blackest in the history of motorsport. So many young men would die at the wheel of his cars, the Vatican accused Ferrari of being like the god Saturn, who consumed his own sons. The surviving Ferrari frontline team was made up of three drivers. One of them was Italian Luigi Musso, who was having a passionate affair with 18-year-old Fiamma Bresci. My pure... Never again in my life was I so happy and in love as I was with him. It was an incredible and amazing thing. Musso's teammates were two dashing Englishmen, Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins. The team, however, was soon at each other's throats, a situation Ferrari encouraged. He would write to me about the badgering he would have to put up with from these two people, because strength comes in numbers and they were united against Luigi. I think Ferrari was perfectly willing to play off his drivers against each other if it, uh, if it meant that they would go faster and that one of them eventually would, would, uh, would win the race. He certainly uh, liked a little bit of controversy. And if there wasn't any going at that time, everything was running smoothly, you can be certain that Mr Ferrari would come along and create some. He did expect uh, the maximum uh, um, out of a driver and perhaps a shade more and um, used to think that, um, you know, the psychological pressure would uh, produce better results from the drivers. To add pressure to the team's situation, their cars were becoming uncompetitive. English garage owners had revolutionized racing car design. On the track, the green English cars raced by drivers such as Sterling Moss were beating Ferrari's beautiful red machines. Look at the beauty of it. I mean, fantastic. 
the engine in the front. Not that huge, I mean, it's two and a half litre. This one's a six cylinder. Everything is so beautiful, but not as good as that one because it wasn't as agile as the Cooper. You've got a lot less weight because the engine's there, the wheels are there, the gearbox is here. So you haven't got a, you haven't got a prop shaft coming through as you have with that one. This car you put on, that one you get into. This one actually will beat that one. Ferrari had a set view as to what a racing car should be. Raw horsepower was everything. He resisted change. So for much of the 58 season, his poor handling Ferraris were being beaten. By the time the Ferrari team got to the French Grand Prix, Luigi Musso, in particular, was feeling the pressure. The shadow of Nuvolari's great victory over the Germans lay behind Ferrari's expectations of his drivers. A driver could always overcome inferior equipment to win. He would expect a driver to go beyond what I would consider to be reasonable limits. I think, uh, you know, you can drive to the maximum of your ability and uh, you know, once you start psyching yourself up to do things which you don't feel are perhaps going to be within your capability, I mean, that is stupid. And, uh, you know, the, it was dangerous enough in those times without uh, uh, driving deliberately over the limit. Musso's girlfriend, Fiamma Bresci, would go to most of the Grand Prix and was watching the race from the pits. A settimo giro. On the seventh lap, Luigi didn't come round. I thought his car might have broken down or he might have stopped. Nobody made a signal. And when there is no signal, it's bad. Musso had come off the circuit at 150 miles an hour and later died. Everything is finished. Everything ruined. Everything denied and shattered. I was young and my entire world collapsed and I couldn't see a way out. I ran for the window, which is open, of course, because it was July, it was hot. I ran for the window to throw myself out. Within six months, Musso's two teammates were also dead. Peter Collins died racing at the Nürburgring, Mike Hawthorne in a car crash in England. The entire Ferrari frontline team of 58 were wiped out. The Ferrari name and its associations with those guys, you know, who, who existed in a different world, is very important to Formula One now because it's a symbol of all that. It's a symbol of the history of a sport that once was the most dangerous sport on earth and still trades on those associations. Fiamma Bresci had lost her boyfriend. She now found herself the object of Ferrari's attentions. E lui ha sempre manifestato per scritto questa cosa che ormai l'aveva preso. He kept writing to me about his passion for me, which was literally consuming him. He was going insane. Then he moved from burning love to hate. He wrote that he couldn't conceive of his life without my love. He asked me if I wanted to marry him, and I couldn't, first of all because I was still in love, and second because of the age difference. After two years they started a relationship. Fiamma was to remain close to Ferrari for the rest of his life. His domestic arrangements were becoming increasingly complicated. He'd moved into one of the biggest houses in Modena with his mother and with his wife, Laura. There were two people in his family he relied on, his mother and his wife. The fights between man and wife were terrible. I would say every day, but it was more like every night than day. 
I used to ask myself, how could she be so aggressive all night? He found respite in a parallel second family, for Ferrari also had a long-standing relationship with local woman Lina Lardi. They met before the war, and together they had an illegitimate son called Piero, born in 1945. My mother was a very patient, calm woman who loved the quiet life. He would come every day for lunch, and the thing the kids remember is that he'd come every day with a present. It wasn't a normal family, I know, but that was the only family I knew. And this is perhaps one of the less known sides to him, where he took off the dark glasses and became a much sweeter, more affectionate man than he liked to show the world. In public, Ferrari had started cultivating an air of deliberate mystique behind his trademark dark sunglasses. He knew how to work his moods to get what he wanted. There was something sort of positively operatic about him. I suspect also probably a little bit ham. We called him Zacconi after an old theatre actor because he was so convincing. He managed to make himself appear upset, hurt. He was capable of everything. By the early 1960s, he had built his business into the biggest name in motor racing. He'd stopped going to Grand Prix races. He would sit alone and watch them on TV in his office, receiving intelligence and issuing orders by phone. The thing about Ferrari, he was the spider at the center of the web. You know, that's what he made himself. You know, everybody had to come to him. Uh, and usually they got eaten before they could escape. But beneath the tough exterior, there were other reasons why he chose to hide behind his dark glasses. He was painfully shy. He was fundamentally a shy man. Not many people noticed it, but I knew he was shy. Perhaps this accounts for the fact Ferrari famously never travelled anywhere. In the last 30 years of his life, he didn't spend a single night away from Modena. In the meantime, the world was coming to him. His cars were accruing iconic status. Well, here's a Ferrari 250 GTO, very possibly the greatest car ever made. And only 39 of them were made in two years after 1962. It's the last Ferrari which could plausibly be used on the road and to race with. And that gives it its special sort of almost, you know, elegiac force. It's one of the things which made it worth you know, eight million pounds. I think part of the reason these cars exercise such visceral appeal over, over us is that they're very, very beautiful, but they're also a little bit menacing and a little bit threatening. Now, the public recognized that. They realized that Ferrari had astonishing mystique because the greatest drivers were always drawn to them. But also, some of the greatest celebrities were too. Movie stars, hustlers, playboys, millionaires, operators, gangsters, spivs, all the riffraff and flotsam you find in the Riviera. Uh, they were attracted to Ferrari. And what did Enzo Ferrari think of all this? Frankly, not very much. I think uh, one suspects that really he held the people who sought mere glamour in his cars, he held them in a sort of contempt. They were a necessary evil. Uh, for him, the passion was always racing. And yet, where it mattered on the track, from 1964 to 1975, Ferrari won nothing. Despite being in his eighth decade, Enzo Ferrari still hadn't given up his lifelong search for the perfect driver. Salvation seemed to arrive with a steely young Austrian, Niki Lauda, who won him a world championship in 1975. But the relationship was soon under pressure. But when it happened that these pilots became too bravi, Ad esempio, when drivers started becoming too good, at some point, for instance, Lauda started taking all the credit and people started saying that Ferrari was winning because of him, this is something he didn't like very much. In 1976, once again, a Ferrari driver would lay his life on the line. 
In the championship, Lauda was well ahead of his nearest rival, Englishman James Hunt. But it all went horribly wrong at the Nürburgring. Lauda was pulled from the wreck by his fellow drivers. He had inhaled lungfuls of toxic smoke. He was in intensive care for four days and was read the last rites. Just five weeks after his crash, he was behind the wheel of a Ferrari. First day I went out of the pits, I couldn't change into second gear because I was so frightened that I couldn't drive. So the fear just hit me and I couldn't drive. But amazingly, Lauda persisted. A week later, he was on the starting grid of the Italian Grand Prix at Monza to defend the championship lead for Enzo Ferrari. He came to Monza bleeding. He was still a boy. He was in a pitiful state. No one would have believed it. Yet, he had the courage to race at Monza. Astonishingly, Lauda finished fourth. Now the whole season came down to the last race at the Japanese Grand Prix. Hunt and Lauda bid for glory in the torrential rain. Jody Schechter also drove in that race. You can be going along the straight and all of a sudden the car just, you know, just aquaplanes and then you just have no control at all and it normally goes back. And then the visibility, you can't see. And so if there's something that happens in the track, you won't see it. You'll just you'll hit it at 180 miles an hour and not even realize. After one lap, it proved too much for Nicky Lauda. And Nicky Lauda has pulled into the pit in front of us. Nicky Lauda, the world champion, has pulled into the pit. When he came back into the pits after one lap and told me, Mauro, I don't feel I can continue, and I asked him, do you want me to find a technical excuse? Shall we say that it was an electrical problem caused by the humidity? He replied, no, Mauro, I will say that I simply did not have the strength to carry on. Nicky was brave to actually get out the car. I was never that brave. Lauda's bravery cost Ferrari the championship. Ferrari rarely forgave a driver who parked up an operable racing car. That did his head in. It was his way of dealing with that kind of a behavior. Drivers had to take risks and win, even if there were difficult times. He expected the driver, when he got behind the wheel, to give his all. The relationship between Lauda and Ferrari never recovered. Just one year later, a last young man came along who might satisfy Ferrari's lifelong search for the perfect driver. I said, boss, I saw a driver who reminded me of Nuvolari. He's Canadian, and I think he's called Villeneuve. He drove like Ferrari's old master, Nuvolari. And now Villeneuve's in second position. <laughs> Villeneuve goes over the corrugation. You saw him getting really excited. And as soon as this overtaking, overtaking, overtaking took place, he said, Bensi, now I got to take a pill. And he went to the toilet to take a pill to calm himself down. Second and Villeneuve go. Incredible! Villeneuve stood on everything, locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position. But Villeneuve too fell victim to the intense atmosphere Ferrari fostered within his team. At the San Marino Grand Prix in 1982, his teammates snatched victory by deliberately disobeying team orders.
He knew that he'd been had. Ferrari weren't really um, supporting him that much, actually. I think, I, I don't know, but maybe they were playing the, the one against the other game at that stage. In his next race, Villeneuve crashed and died. He was the last to die in the service of Enzo Ferrari. In his twilight years, Ferrari was a huge international figure. In Italy, they called him the Pope of the North. Once condemned by the Vatican, the real Pope now had to come to Ferrari's factory to pay homage to him. In his final decade, he focused on who would inherit his legacy. His wife Laura died in 1978. The path was clear to legitimize Ferrari's surviving son. Piero became his official son and heir. In 1988, Ferrari died in his sleep. The man whose life and success was so entwined with death had finally succumbed. Ferrari overshadows motor racing. And how it's achieved that extraordinary degree of support um, is really through one, the memory of one man's charisma, Enzo Ferrari, and what he instilled in that team. Enzo Ferrari's company wasn't so much a car manufacturer, uh, it was an entire belief system. Ferrari completely transcends the limitations of the mere automobile and instead works, you know, on the same level as myth and religion. It's something you believe in, it's something which moves people. The Ferrari team were to remain in the wilderness for the best part of another decade until the arrival of Michael Schumacher. He has won them six world championships. He is the most successful Grand Prix driver ever. Ironically, Enzo Ferrari never met his team's perfect driver. <laughs>